another episode of Dialogues with me, Richard Reeves. My guest today was Roland Betancourt, who is Professor of Art History at the University of California in Irvine. We talk mostly about his book, Byzantine Intersectionality, Sexuality, Gender and Race in, in the Middle Ages. So it's a tour across a wide range of history, particularly in what's sometimes referred to as the Eastern Roman Empire. And at one point, Roland says, I'm less interested in showing that the medieval world was modern than that the modern world is in many ways medieval. And and what he means by that, I think, is that there's an ambiguity and uh, a fluidity in some ways to discussions of gender and consent and orientation and so on uh, in that period, in the medieval period, and particularly in what's now called the Byzantine Empire, than we perhaps might think. So that means we're covering quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of, of ground. But I think Rollins a really uh, fascinating scholar. He looks at history and art and theology, sex and gender, the role of the liturgy and so on. So genuinely multidisciplinary and kind of going, or as he says, where the question takes him. Uh, and so we therefore go through a brief history of that that period of the, the Roman Empire. Um, we talk about the the slut shaming, as he calls it, of the Empress Theodora and the importance today as much as one and a half thousand years ago of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, the fascinating lives and deaths of trans monks during that monastic period, the significance of Mary's consent to become the mother of Christ and what that means for agency more generally uh, in history, the messiness and ambiguity of human life, frailty, uh, and uh, identity. So uh, I should warn you that inevitably, I think there's some adult uh, content in this episode, but um, very broad ranging. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed it hugely as I've enjoyed his work. I think he's calling it as he sees it and is very respectful of different traditions, um, even as he comes at it from his own perspective. Um, so uh, I should also say that um, we're approaching the uh, holiday period so for those who who celebrate merry christmas happy holidays to everybody and i'll be taking a short break so uh, i'll be back uh, on january 10th thanks for listening roland welcome to dialogues thank you it's a pleasure to be here yeah it's great great to meet you in person i followed you your work and uh, followed you on on social media uh, and elsewhere and we're going to be talking about about your your latest book um but before we get into that and and the whole notion of byzantine intersectionality and queer culture in the Byzantine Empire and so on. Can we say a little bit about you for those who don't who don't know your work? Because I you're I think you're formerly an art art historian, but it's clear to me that you're as much theologian uh early early Christian I, I I you seem to be very multidisciplinary. So how did you end up here? I like to say that I go to where the questions take me to. And as an art historian, I've always seen my formation very much as an expansive one. And one of the things that I think a lot of scholars who work on the medieval past, on the Byzantine Empire, we're very aware that even if we are within a certain discipline, whether we be historians in our training or art historians in our training, the field always require us requires us to go into these other areas to do the type of work, whether it be doing a critical edition of a text to understand its history and its transmission through manuscripts, or parsing out the subtle theological nuances of everything from ritual acts to the images that we work with. So that is actually what attracted me to working on the medieval world, and particularly the Byzantine Empire, because it really is a space that encourages you to be many things at once. Yeah, that certainly comes across uh, in your work. And I wonder if that isn't partly because the uh, the world wasn't divided for people, ordinary people then in the way that perhaps it is now. So today we'll sort of tend to think, of, oh, oh, that's theology, that's sociology, that's psychology. But but the lived experience of yeah, I don't know, someone in the 7th century, 7th century Constantinople did not separate their theology very clearly from their politics and from their psychology and from their occupation and so on. People's lives, those things were mixed up for for ordinary people, right? In a way, they're not now. Is that fair? Completely. And for example, I think thinking about just the category of art is a really good way of explaining this sort of divide where my colleagues who work on modern art history, there are layers of critique and theory around art itself that define it in a very particular way and the methods that you can use to explore that are very different. Um, not also to mention the fact of 
archives where you can think about artistic process and so forth. And so when you are an art historian of the pre-modern past, you're a lot more interested in how art works in the world and the various expansive ways in which it can be defined and understood. And it's not to say that there isn't a sort of robust aesthetic theorization in the period, um, which I think is oftentimes a stereotype. There certainly is, but it is a theorization that intersects with so many important issues about sort of the theological debates of the time. So you can't have an image of Christ without first sorting out the sort of theology and Christological understanding of what the Christ is, what is the relationship between the human and the divine, what is the role of the body and representation and color and form, how is that possible? And so the ability to depict Christ was always discussed as a fact that the incarnation allowed him, for example, to be depictable in colors because he consented and condescended to become incarnate in human flesh. And so these are the types of theological nuances that in particularly attracted me to the Byzantine Empire, because I saw in these types of work, a lot of the rich theoretical discussions that, for example, we could understand in the sort of questions of modern art, whether it be about questions of abstraction and representation, or figural representation, or other debates about sort of the category of art as sort of separate from other spaces of cultural production. Yeah, it's interesting. And we'll, we'll get on to maybe St. Mary of Egypt at some point in a moment, but also, but also because of the way you use this term transmasculine, but also just thinking more generally tra in a trans way, that the depictions of you know, someone less, actually, so let's talk about you know, St. Mary of Egypt, as I've mentioned her now, and you can maybe say a little bit about uh, about her, but her and her depictions, and it hadn't really occurred to me until I sort of read you pointing this out, that she's, she's very masculine in her representations in standard iconography and so on too. So say a little bit about who... This wasn't where I was planning to start, actually, but St. Mary of Egypt and how she embodies some of these issues around masculinity, femininity and kind of queerness that you come across in this period. Sure. Um, I actually started off the book with um, Mary of Egypt. She's actually a figure that was supposed to be in my trans chapter. And then I sort of moved her into the opening of the book because I thought... Um, in many ways, she's low-hanging fruit. Everyone in sort of medieval studies is familiar with her story. She has a very vibrant life throughout the Middle Ages. And so she's really a sort of great way of communicating a lot of the intersecting issues that come up in the book without being precisely a sort of like key example of just one um, circumstance or category. And so St. Mary of Egypt is an early Christian saint. Um, we have her stories um, passed on throughout the Middle Ages, and some of the earliest versions of the story um, tell us of a sort of general gist of her life that continues to be transmitted through the centuries, um, where Mary is this very sexually promiscuous figure. Um, the author tells us that um, her sexual appetite could never be satisfied, and so that she actually was a sex worker, not because she needed the money or wanted the money, but just simply because that was the easiest way of satisfying her sexual desires. She basically ends up in Jerusalem because she sees a group of hot guys boarding a ship, mm. essentially, and she decides to follow them. The text tells us that she even rapes the men on the ship because of her sexual lust, and then has a definitely a come-to-Jesus moment in Jerusalem um, at some undisclosed time later on, and therefore runs off into the desert to protect men from her lust. And much of Mary's story comes after this climactic moment where she meets um, this monk Sosimus um, in the desert, who at first is not sure what she is, almost mm -hmm. thinking that she's a demon or some sort of, that she looked burnt like an Ethiopian um, because she was this dark figure from living out in the elements. And in many representations, of course, Mary of Egypt becomes associated with these sort of masculinized um, tropes, which really echoes the sort of interest in the period in understanding that because masculinity is seen to be a sort of higher state of being um, than the lowness, lowness of femininity, um, for many early Christian martyrs, um, for women, there's this, ascent, this idea that you sort of ascend to masculinity. Um, as one author puts it, um, through piety and asceticism, women become men and men become angels. So this sort of idea of ascent through um, spaces of gender identity that very much get... Mm -hmm 
then sort of articulated in different spaces throughout the Middle Ages um, in these other tropes that become a lot more articulated um, as sort of transfigures and this and using this term very capaciously to understand that then there are, there's this idea that the sort of shifts in gender identity are something that are a p- very integral part of how Christianity is attempting to articulate itself and sort of find a language for thinking through its sort of concerns around gender and spirituality. Yes, it's striking that um, the concern for the the lust of women in particular uh, was obviously is very strong. I think it gets much stronger in Western Christianity and as uh, as some of those ideas uh, develop. But even there, you can see this concern uh, around sensuality and so on being associated with women. Whereas if, I think, if, ever, if anything, the evidence for which of the two sexes, I'm using my terms quite specifically now, are more driven by sex, uh, it's pretty clearly men, natal men, rather than natal women. And so it's almost sort of taken for granted because many of the people in this period had multiple wives or they'd had, you know, they had concubines and, and so on. And that was sort of normal, right? So so it's, in other ways, it was just part of this kind of historic issue about women having, it was when women were lustful that it was a problem because we could have took men's, men's lustfulness almost for granted, even in that period. And so I, I'm wondering whether that's part of the reason why for the kind of concern about women's sensuality and why they're seen as the ones who have this problem, whereas I think the evidence points strongly the other way. Yeah, well, this becomes, of course, within monastic spaces, these types of concerns become very important. I think two examples that really show this off is um, one of the challenges faced by um, male monks who are celibate is the problem of wet dreams and nocturnal emissions. And so then you have all these texts that are basically this fear that you might have essentially um, sexual dreams and how do you stop that to be truly fully released from sexual desire? Um, And how do you try to prevent nocturnal emissions as well? And one of the sort of interesting aspects, and this is particularly relevant in the Byzantine Empire, is that there, um, the uh, appearance and existence of eunuchs is quite common. Um, And so there's always throughout the history of the Byzantine Empire, there's this very strong sort of gender anxiety about eunuchs, especially in monastic spaces around questions of sexuality, because of course, so eunuchs, just very briefly, in the Byzantine Empire um, were castrated by having the testicles removed, um, so it's not a full castration as exists in other spaces. And so depending on when figures were castrated, they might still have erections and other sort of abilities to have sexual intercourse. And so eunuchs really become this interesting sticking point because there's the idea that they sometimes they're accused of taking the sort of the easy way out um, by sort of containing their sexual desire by um, being castrated, even though the reality is that those categories are far more uncomfortable than perhaps you would want to understand, especially when eunuchs are serving as imperial guards and very high-ranking authorities. And so certainly there is this um, anxiety about sexuality that also, in a very conceptual way, gets sort of projected onto ideas of gender. And so gender stereotypes um, as an abstraction become a really sort of useful tool for thinking through questions of sexuality um, with these sort of stereotypes of what women desire and what men desire and what is the sort of in-between. Yes. And actually, it's st- striking to me that um, I think this issue of removing of the, the testicles in particular became such an issue, the church actually had to forbid it. Yeah, it had to have ha- actually ent- ended up, ha- it's quite striking when you read that history. It's like, wow. I mean, I think actually just generally looking at what the church and the civil authorities generally felt the need to ban or prohibit gives you a pretty good sense of how widespread that issue must have been. And the church did have to say, look, please please stop this practice because it was clearly not that uncommon for people to choose this path. Certainly. And there's what's really also fascinating is that going sort of a step beyond that is the fact that you also begin to see how many things are explicitly banned and forbidden um, precisely for these reasons that we were discussing, um, but that still exist in these um, spaces and also times as normative practices of the church. So, for example, when I discuss sort of 
um, the presence of these trans saints, which are these figures who are assigned female at birth, but for various reasons choose to live out their lives um, as male monastics, we have prohibitions against all forms of cross-dressing in the period. And yet you have these stories that are being transmitted as very pious religious stories that demonstrate precisely what is banned by various church councils. And so I think that's one of the things that we often forget in thinking about Christianity through modern eyes is that dogmatics, as we understand it, really were far more fluid and complex. What I love about early Christianity, late antiquity, and the Middle Ages is that there's never an understanding of this is the law, this is what the Bible says, and that's it. There's always this idea of, okay, the Bible makes no sense on this topic. How do we reason this out? It's very much of a scholastic and intellectual process of understanding this relationality between a sort of canonical text and how do you comprehend and understand that. And of course, there's great um, deep history of that in Judaism as well and in Islam. Um, so very much a sort of highly intellectual understanding of religion that in the modern world we very much see as sort of these um, binary opposites. Yes, there's a, a sense of working through what all of this stuff means in practice and uh, in everyday life and for law and so on. It's much more, it's much more alive in that sense, in that Correct. period, right? I mean, just, we should back up a little bit. We've, uh, we've, we've done what I said I wouldn't do, which is dive straight in. Uh, and we'll come back to, certainly come back to trans monks. And I want to talk about Theodora uh, and probably the Annunciation. Let's see how much time we have. But um, we talk that Byzantine uh, and empire uh, are, are terms we've already kind of used. So just let's take a step back and say, which, which era are you talking about? And, and which geography are you talking about? When you say, when they say the Byzantine Empire or this period, um, what, are, what are you talking about? Because I think most people have a vague idea it was a Western Roman Empire and then didn't it split? And then did the East bit last a bit longer than the West bit? And then what happened to... So just give us a right. sort of 101. Well, what I always like to say is that I love the fact that I have very clear end dates. Basically, um, if you define sort of the foundation of Constantinople, modern day Istanbul, as the capital of the Byzantine Empire, you can really say that the empire goes from May 330 all the way through May 1453, which I particularly love as a sort of nice sort of bracketing. <laughs> and of course, um, the Byzantine Empire is a totally artificial term. Byzantium um, would have been used to refer to the city of Constantinople because its ancient name was Byzantion in Greek. Um, and Byzantine becomes a term that sort of emerges in the early modern period to describe what is better known as the Eastern Roman Empire. The Byzantines understood themselves to be Romans. They discussed themselves as the land of the Romans. They are the Roman Romaioi. Um, there is a full understanding of the Byzantines as um, being the continuation of the Roman Empire. And that very much marks its identity. So the Roman Empire, except they speak Greek instead of Latin after a certain period. Um, and so roughly the chronology for me in the most expansive way um, is really from roughly the 4th century, that might be a little bit early, on to, up to the 15th century. Um, and just to give you some markers. We mentioned Theodora, um, Theodora and Justinian, um, under whose rule the Church of Hagia Sophia is built. That's in the 6th century. Um, and I, as a historian, tend to focus on the 11th century um, largely. And so the empire really is this very um, long-standing space, and the boundaries of it are also quite porous because it not only sort of ebbs and flows in territory um, at the height of the 6th century, essentially taking control of the entire Mediterranean, um, and then, of course, with territories sort of ebbing and flowing throughout and having very close contact um, with the Syriac world, the Armenian, the Georgian world. And so it's, it's an empire, especially when you look at its art, that it's very fluid in its impact in the space. And so that's what I also particularly love about it, that there's no category and terminology in Byzantium that is not, in many ways, hotly contested. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, se it seems to me there's a theme emerging here, which is that you you're drawn to the authentic messiness 
of human existence, right? And, and there's something very messy about this whole period. You know, the Persians come and go, and there's the Islamic, and then the East splits away, the Church splits. For a while, they're in charge of Rome, but then they're not, and then the Romans split. So it's kind, of, it's just, it's, it's a hot mess basically uh, throughout that period, right? And it seems like that, in a way, that messiness around all kinds of things, around identity, around theology, you know, including gender identity, theology, the nature of the empire, etc., is uh as depicted very often through art uh is one of the things that appeals to you and i wonder if that's one of the reasons why thinking about this visually is helpful to you because sometimes we're using artistic forms to try and make sense of the mess right? and so you'll see icons that have different times or different periods and so on too um, and and i guess to add to the mess too but the story you've just painted is of a it's a pretty messy empire yeah and i think what I would say about the empire is that it's it's also messy in the sense in its relationality to the West. Um, it's you know this is the empire that can read all of classical literature because they they are fluent in Greek, um, which the West is as we move on less so being able to do so. Um, and they also, of course, can read the Bible in its original language, not in translation. There is this intimacy with the sources. They can read also the corpus of theology that the West not necessarily has access to. And so there's this deep learning and transmission of learning that creates a sort of very parallel. What I love about Byzantium, it's that it's sort of the it's sort of the alternative history parallel universe of Western Christendom. Um, and there are tensions that arise over time. One of the things that I love to communicate to my students, to friends, um, to colleagues in other areas, is that you have a great schism in the middle of the 11th century. And this great schism essentially boils down to two major things. One, that in the creed, the Latins have the word filioque, which defines how the progression of the Holy Spirit moves through the Father and Son and so forth. Um, and because of the use of leavening in the bread. So the Western world does not use leavening to emulate the rite of Christ. And then, of course, the Greek um, um, East uses leavening because it embodies the ensoulment of the Christ in the Eucharist. And because of that, that is one of the major rifts. We're debating here. We're causing a major church rift over leavening. And I, I absolutely adore that because it demonstrates just how powerful these theological and conceptual issues were for the Middle Ages. This is an empire that is fighting about the utility of images, the, how images actually work and parsing that out. It is an empire that is really operating as its priorities, the most highly lofty and conceptual issues of the time. And that's what has always attracted me to Byzantium, which then when compared to Western Christendom, seems so unruly. It seems so messy. It seems so, um, what's the word? Um, trivial in many ways. And that's what hmm. also has been fascinating to think about the ways in which Byzantium really has been maligned um, in sort of Western sources. I always use the the example of Edward Gibbon and the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, where Byzantium is always sort of the, the straw man and like um, the object that gets bullied as those effeminate Greeks of Byzantium. Right. There is already this sort of queering of Byzantium in its language, precisely because of the fact that suddenly you have an empire filled with eunuchs and you have an empire with all these, in various ways, gender nonconforming figures, either in how they're seen by the West or how they are understood within the sources. And so that really is what excites me about this, because there's a seriousness to um, the way that art and theology function throughout, um, which is not to say it doesn't exist in the West, it just takes a different sort of tenor. Um, the West is interested in various forms of apocalypticism in later periods, a sort of piety that is rooted on sort of an empathy with the suffering of Christ, very different tactics and tenor of Christianity than we see in the Eastern Empire. I was glad, I'm glad you mentioned Gibbon because I think 
the, you make the very good case that there's a, a to some extent a, a, a queering of the east if you like by the west um mm -hmm. and you, you quote him specifically but this idea of, and of course that gets wrapped up with greeks you know you, you, you if you say the word greek to certain kinds of western scholars then you, you're you're halfway to saying i mean you don't need to say queer anymore uh or gender non-conforming because you're kind of part way there and because of the messiness uh, and so on and maybe because of some of the figures who are involved in it too i like the way you frame the seriousness of these apparently trivial debates. I mean, I think, again, it's a reminder that, you know, in the fourth century, I can't remember who it was that said now, that said you couldn't wander around the streets of Constantinople and every barber shop and every cafe, all you could hear about was you know, loud arguments about the nature of Christ and Christ's divinity, right? Um, in, in the same way that today people might be arguing about... Uh, I don't know. I, I'd like to say the Kardashians, but it's probably Donald Trump or something. But, do you know, but what, right. whatever, whatever, whatever it is, it's not. It's not Christological, but it was then. I mean, these, those, these. In other words, these were not just not just elite issues. In fact, quite often oh. there were there were more uh, issues uh, that were driven by the masses. Quite often, these were sort of deeply failed. The schisms that we see aren't are sometimes politically driven, uh, but they're very often not. I mean, very often they're really. They're part of every, everyday existence. And so I think that's part of the, the, the everydayness of some of these issues really comes from. Yeah. And what I love about that is that one of the most important things that Byzantium has to offer us as historians is, um, and you know, sort of popular understanding is to understand just the diversity of Christianity as a religion, which is something that we don't really understand beyond sort of um, a sort of Protestant debate against Catholicism and later on, but throughout its early history, the you know, the debates of the period of Justinian and Theodora were the Chalcedonians versus the non-Chalcedonians, which essentially boils down to whether you followed the decrees of the Council of Chalcedon that defined the nature of Christ, or if you didn't. Um, and then what heresy did you ascribe to? And the fact that it wasn't a heresy for all involved is also something that's very important if we take a step back from a sort of dogmatic history of Christianity where there's rights and wrongs. Um, and seeing, of course, if you walk through 6th century Constantinople, it would not only be, you know, here's the church of Hagia Sophia, but it would also be like, here are these other churches that ascribe to different understandings of what Christ is. Um, and that's what's really exciting and dynamic about the empire, that these debates also continue in different ways throughout its long history yes and actually i want to, uh, i'll ask you now i think about the hagia sophia because I, I i got quite interested in that in that myself a little while ago um and in particular i wonder how you as a historian and as someone interested in this period feel about the decision of erdogan to re reopen hagia sophia as a, a mosque as it was for of course i don't know it was half a millennium after being a church for a millennium, I mean, I'm rounding up here, but but, but, but you know, roughly speaking, it's, it's about right, isn't it? Um, right. And then a museum, and then a museum for a century. So it was a museum for a flicker uh, of time after having been a uh, a mosque, obviously after the the conquest of Constantinople in 1451, and then Erdogan last year turned it back into a, a mosque. What's your what's your personal and professional reaction to that? Yeah. So I mean, it's it's. Erdogan is difficult because, of course, it's he's a very Trumpian politician, and so I don't want mm. to excuse that. But one thing that I would say is that Hagia Sophia has always been a political monument. And that's something that we oftentimes really play down or ignore um, in our thinking about this space, especially because we have such a post-Enlightenment or just, you know, 2021 <laughs> view of... Um, the division between church and state, for example. But, you know, Justinian builds Hagia Sophia um, in a matter of six years because the old Hagia Sophia has been burnt down by a riot or uprising that basically um, unfolds after two warring factions, the Greens and the Blues, um, go at it and destroy the city. This has always been sort of described as a sports brawl, but it's really far more complicated. We see in the historical sources that Justine and Theodora were actually playing the Blues and the Greens, which were political factions in the city against one another, um, rising tensions, especially with the Chalcedonian, non-Chalcedonian debates happening mm -hmm. at the time. Um, Justinian was really brutal in, its, in his politics um, and, and really was placing a lot of um, sort of using the law very haphazardly. And so there was a lot of tension. And basically, they arrest a bunch of members. Two of them get spared. And they're basically demanding for the release of these prisoners before they get executed. 
And then the city gets essentially burned down. Justinian eventually brings the population into the Hippodrome and slaughters what some historians believe are about 10% of the city's population. So Hagia Sophia is built very suddenly after that as a way of purging the city from that destruction and was must have been a very difficult monument at the time of sort of the loss of life and the violence of the empire. And throughout its history, it is the center of imperial ceremonies. It is the center of the coronations. You know, when Mehmet II, Mehmet the Conqueror, enters Constantinople, he prohibits the looting of Hagia Sophia. There, mm. There's a sort of immediately he goes in and it's like, absolutely not. You are not destroying this monument. And there's a great deal of preservation and care given to Hagia Sophia. So it has really been the stage and an active participant in empire for so long, which so nicely aligns also to Ataturk's sort of understanding of this modern Turkish Republic. In that moment, what is Hagia Sophia to be? But of course, a secular modern monument of modernity. Um, and my dissertation advisor, Rob Nelson, has this wonderful book also about the understanding of Hagia Sophia as this modern monument. And what does it mean to be modern? You make boulevards around it. You create this sort of monument within the sort of language of sort of a 19th century French vocabulary. And so in thinking about this, I really see this as a sort of non-sentimental sort of as a historical view that, of course, it makes sense that Hagia Sophia in this moment would also be a sort of a political space. And that's something that's very important to understand. This is a, Hagia Sophia for a long time has been the stage of empire. So it makes very much sense to me that in this moment, Hagia Sophia would operate as a mosque in this conservative space. And it's, it's of course, difficult because Erdogan's politics affect what is a very diverse and liberal city as well um, of Istanbul. And that's sort of the, the thing that is difficult to comprehend, this sort of the fact that this is, of course, a ploy of empire, as it always mm. has been. Mm. So you, you're giving me a very good profession, professional historian answer. And I will say that, I mean, I... I I actually wrote a thing with Mustafa Akyol about this, where mm -hmm. we, we, where we, we um, suggested that there could become a shared space. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, that's incredibly, incredibly idealistic uh, in the current Turkish political environment, but there's no reason, in principle, why it couldn't. You couldn't have part of it consecrated um, as a Christian church, and you know, Friday prayers could happen, and you know, divine liturgy could happen, and and so on. Obviously, that's not the world we're in. No, um, and I'm not sure what the next, you know, least worst option is. Well, it is, you know, one of the things that's very touching to me, um, I was in Hagia Sophia October of 2019 and leaving that the Hagia Sophia, um, I was taking images for one of my books and I was leaving Hagia Sophia in the evening and the call to prayer was sounding and it was a very touching moment of a space that was so much about its acoustics and performance that's sort of been sterilized as a modern monument to understand a part of its history. And that's the other thing that we have to understand, like, being a mosque is also a part of Hagia Sophia's history. It's not about purging that, and it's such a beautiful part of its history that I, I cannot be fully angry to see it as an enlivened space that people care about and are playing out some of the dynamics. I mean, even the use of figural imagery, which sort of very much covered up and revealed through high-tech um, um, banners or whatever we call them now. Um, th this is also a debate that was being had throughout the Ottoman Empire. Do, are these images a problem? And for a long time, the Virgin um, in the apse was visible um, to the congregation. And, you know, I think <laughs> it's, it's, it's sad in our modern world to see debates between religions that are so intimately tied to one another. They are the religions of the book. Um, they are they have the same figures that they worship. And it's sort of, I really wish to see a Hagia Sophia that can sort of understand these identities much more unified um, rather than one or the other. Um, and so that is, I mean, I do like that Hagia Sophia has reclaimed a part of its voice. And so that's what at I least, find very yes. touching of it. Um, at, least it's a, at least it has a sort of spiritual identity now but it but I, I love your point too is like in some ways you know this this is probably a general proposition for humanity the the smaller the difference the more the more vicious the the battle will be it's a sort of just so that there's a comic version with the judean people's front from life of brian but it would be your family member or it would be like that, that, that and that you're, you're right the argument between the chalcedonian non-chalcedonian christians or then kind of within the syriac church or you know within southern baptism i mean they tend to be the most they, they tend to be the most vicious because they're the closest, right? So Correct. in some and, ways. And, right. Yeah, it's the tragic 
tragically um, horrendous part of history to see those things unfold. Whereas I feel yeah. like the the more the more massive gaps, it sort of don't even register on the spectrum, which is so fascinating. I mean, I think in well, some ways it speaks to the closeness and proximity that enables for discourse and how that discourse becomes at times too emphatic or vitriolic but yeah because yeah, i guess we're competing on the same the same ground so um well that was uh, the Hagia Sophia thing was fa- fascinating i'm glad well actually it's a nice way into justinian and theodora so you've already mentioned justinian who's arguably well one of if not the most important of the uh of the emperors building the Hagia Sophia obviously his legal code is passed down I remember as an undergraduate studying Roman law and I'm like oh yeah that's Justinian and and you know underpins a lot of that so tell us a bit about Justinian and and particularly Theodora because you talk about the slut shaming mm-hmm. uh of Theodora um and, and how she's treated both at the time Uh, and more generally so just situate that couple for us if you like and then talk a little bit about how theodora has been received both then and now sure um yeah justinian and theodora and i think it's worth mentioning belisarius his general who really sort of you know is credited for um justinian's conquest of land um and the power over the mediterranean um, our figures at, and one other figure here that's very important are, is Procopius, the court historian. Um, you know, in Procopius's book on Justinian's wars and on his buildings, we see a very rosy image of an emperor who is really, you know, expanding the empire and having many sort of terrestrial conquests. And also an emperor and an empress, Theodora is important in the patronage, really investing a huge amount of time in the restoration of churches um, and in the building of new monuments as well, including Hagia Sophia. And so in the buildings, we have a sort of blow-by-blow discussion of the building of Hagia Sophia after the Nika riots um, or the Nika uprising, um, which we see really a discussion of all the challenges that were faced. Um, Justinian, quite fascinatingly, picked two college professors, essentially, to design Hagia Sophia, who had probably no building experience. As a college professor, I will say, maybe not the greatest idea. Um, And so you see a building that is going to buckle under its own forces and this constant rush, sometimes through angelic intervention, to finish the building quickly. Because probably you couldn't have built it if you took more time. It would have collapsed before all the sort of forces were unified. And so you really see there um, the power of Justinian's um, patronage at large. Then we have another text, which basically exists in one manuscript discovered um, centuries after the empire that is called the secret history. It's sort of the the unpublished history. Um, There are some suspicions that it might have been a sort of draft for an additional volume um, to Procopius's text. But it's really a text that begins by saying, with Procopius's prologue telling us, now that everyone's dead, I can tell you the truth. I would have been killed had I told you any of this. It really sounds like a sort of QAnon conspiracy theory in many ways. It's sort of, Mm. it it weaves in and out from like, his policies were terrible and he did all these like really homophobic things and like it didn't make sense and he was really a terrible ruler and then it switches into, also we are told that he roamed the palace and in the middle of the night and his head would disappear because he was truly a demon. So you've got this real sort of, um, constant weaving in and out between things that we can sort of historically corroborate to other fictions. And one of these great challenges that we have um, is the depiction of Theodora, which Theodora, for example, in the Syriac church is considered a saint and highly pious. Mm-hmm. Um, she has a very rosy history. Um, as well in the buildings, you have a very positive view of her patronage and dedication as an empress. Um, and then here, basically, Procopius, the best modern term is slut-shaming. It's a bullying um, a tactic of saying Theodora was the lowest of the lowest. She started off in the circus. Um, she was apparently famous for this performance where she she wasn't supposed to be naked, so she had a sort of like little thread around her neck, and then she put some grains in her vagina and had some geese eat out of it as a sort of performance of Lita and the Swan. That is one of many. She lamented that the holes in her nipples were not larger so that she could be also penetrated through them. There's all this sort of 
intensely mounting discussion of Theodora's sexuality and sexual appetite that really is the focus of um, Procopius's sort of introduction of this is who Theodora is, and then she married the emperor, basically seduced him. And it's definitely this sort of very, you know, standard misogynistic view that there's this powerful woman who's actually manipulating the sort of weak husband. And that's the model that we have. And one of the sort of fascinating aspects of dealing with Theodora was that, you know, we've had sort of two historical trajectories in the history of Theodora. One is to say, sort of dwell in the sensationalism of all these stories. And the other one has been to sort of purge Theodora from all this and say, no, she was actually a pious woman. And this is just textbook misogyny that we're seeing. And so my interest in this chapter was really to sort of understand a Theodora that could have been these things, but also doesn't have to be submitted to this sort of misogynistic diatribe. Like we're seeing here tropes of women that are precisely using their sexuality to attack them. And stuff that, you know, Theodora as an empress has a particular political sphere around this. Um, but that, you know, these are the type of stereotypes we would have, might have heard of women in sermons and in other spaces on a more local level. Even if Theodora wasn't a circus performer, there were women who were circus performers and who served as sex workers in the city. Um, and so it is a very, for me, it was a sort of very challenging chapter to try to sort of embrace and sort of liberate from this hatred the figure of Theodora and understand, basically the goal of it was to understand, like, what was the subjectivity of this woman that might have existed in Constantinople at the time? And so I use it very much as an avenue to think, for example, about the use of abortives and contraceptives. We have extensive medical texts, some which we suspect could have possibly been written for Theodora and her retinue or someone in the imperial court, that really give us very detailed um, transmissions of knowledge from antiquity about how to make contraceptive suppositories. And one of my favorite details there is that we even have in this gynecology um, sort of alterations from the ancient texts that tell us, and if you add this element, these are basically foolproof. Um, so there's this real um, sort of also evidence of the transmission of knowledge from antiquity that speaks to its sort of constant use. And so for me, this text was a way of understanding these marginalized lives, whether it was specific to Theodora or not. Um, and so for me, it, it really was an avenue for thinking through the fact that with a figure that has so much privilege as an empress, you also have the preservation of texts about her, whether good or bad, that you would never have had preserved for a woman who was a sex worker in the Hippodrome, for example. And so right. it's really about thinking about how do we as historians think creatively about the sources we do have, rather than always say, well, we have no evidence for the common folk, so let's just forget about them. Yeah. It's almost because she was uh, even posthumously kind of worth worth attacking, I guess. I mean, we, what Procopius's motives were is, is another matter. But it's interesting. I mean, thinking about the, the story of St. Mary of Egypt a little bit too, but also of Theodora, is first of all i think they sort of speak to some of this messiness we talked about earlier and this kind of figuring this stuff out the fluidity clearly the hypocrisy because you know as you point out she and justinian did some slut shaming of their own and you know particularly accusing people of of being promiscuously gay and so on too even when they, even even i'm saying even when they weren't and and so the poli the politics of it is is clear. We don't really know the status of, of the text, but there's another version. I mean, I wonder how you react to this idea that the fact that if it was true, if any of that was true of, of Theodora, and it's hard to believe that there wasn't you know, some truth to that. And Justinian himself came from a, you know, a, a relatively mm -hmm. modest background. And so there's a sort of upward mobility story here that can be told as well, which is you've got this circus performer, sex, sex worker, and you've got, I mean, Justinian, I think was like a soldier's son, if I'm remembering kind of correctly, who, who ascend to become the most powerful imperial couple, arguably, certainly as a couple in the history of you know the Roman Empire. And and she was incredibly powerful. You know, she was clearly influential in the theological debates. You know, she was clearly influential on him. Continues to be venerated, as you say, in kind of you know, Eastern, Eastern Orthodox churches of one kind or another. And so there's a sort of redemption story here too, which is a sort of like, yeah, life's complicated and people do various things. And sure, you can focus on them. There's a misogyny behind some of the attacks on her, as there was of the gay men and so on. But there's also a story here about 
redemption and grace and complexity and we're all human and she's an empress as well so in other words she can both be the person with the geese and an incredibly powerful and important and pious empress right that isn't that the right I, I mean i love that you're you're sort of drawing a line here between sort of that there is inherent in the secret history or in sort of considering all these texts together a sort of trajectory that is not separate from what we would see in ha- hagiographic texts of saints' lives, like the idea that saints might emerge in this sort of fallen state um, and that they redeem themselves and become this holy figure. There is potentially here a trajectory as well that we see and very much um, a sort of, I think, the ways in which a sort of history of Theodora that sort of accepts Procopius's account, but also accepts the other realities as sort of unified, we definitely see a trajectory here that is not um, unique to the medieval world, and one that is also, in some ways, very authentic to the way in which Christian audiences would have related to these figures. The idea that you struggle in many ways, whether it be through poverty or sexual desire even, and that you find a sort of redemption arc. Um, these are definitely sort of trajectories that we could see readers at the time sort of identifying with and responding positively with. You know, if I think Procopius' story definitely lacks that redemption arc on its own, but it's definitely something that could be integrated very much into this model. Um, and so that's an, a very important way of also thinking about how, you know, medieval um, readers and sort of listeners understood the sort of characters, that there is something relatable about the figure of Theodora precisely for these reasons, and just like Justinian himself. Yes, and therefore potentially something potentially quite hopeful about their stories. You have to sort of think quite hard about which of the frailties do you want to identify with and not, right? And and what is seen as a frailty and what are the hypocrisies in there and too. But if you see, if you just take these stories, I'm thinking more about St. Mary now, I think of as, you know, whatever we think of the description of her as someone who suffers various kind of human frailties, therefore feel, feels herself to be excluded from god's grace or divinity but achieves it and zosimas zosimas isn't you know he he falls at his he he falls at his feet you know he prostrates himself in front of her such as his his sense of what you know they end up prostrating they end up prostrating themselves to each other at various points and arguing about who should be prostrating themselves to each other but he he and zosimas was a reasonably senior figure so the fact within his monastery and so the fact that he's literally just lying flat on the ground in front of this woman who describes herself that way can also be seen as i think quite an appealing story taking account some of the difficulties with it because it's sort of like well if she can do it Mm -hmm. maybe i can yeah and i think what one of the lovely things about this conversation is that we can also think about the rhetorical force also that a figure in that position would also take you know every time we we find a sort of what we call a colophon, sort of like a scribe sort of notation at the end of a manuscript. You always have these sort of colophons that talk about, I, the wretched John, who have struggled with all these sins, have deigned to make this manuscript for you. There is a very self-effacing language in sort of Christian piety at the time that also could make us understand the way in which like, a holy figure would have actually sort of served as their own critic and hyperbolic critic in defining their past to demonstrate just how wretched they were and what their salvation is. And so there's also a sort of idea that there's sort of this potential for rhetorical force that Mary of Egypt might also have been hyperbolic about what her past actually looked like um, as a structuring of what Christian piety operated and how it operated at the time. Yes, because overcoming the wretchedness is holy in itself, and the St. Andrew of Crete is perhaps a, a great example of that as well. But this, this, and actually, it's a good, it's a good way into this discussion of trans monks, to use the term that you you, you choose to use yourself. But um, which is that this ascetic lifestyle was very often a challenge to political authority, and so uh, actually, you know, these some some of these you know, famous uh, monastic figures ended up becoming incredibly powerful uh, without any kind of formal power because of their because of their what was seen as their holiness and uh, ascetism and you talk about the the monks you referred to this briefly earlier who as you say they're they're natally female but present as 
male and enter monastic communities and you have one or two kind of particular particular examples fr from the l literature um, and you describe them as trans although the the motivations for them entering this these male spaces varied quite quite a bit um, and the extent to which they changed themselves physically or their dress and so on changed a little bit too so talk a little bit about the let's call it the trans monk movement of course there was no such thing it was sure. a movement but but but, it, but i like the idea of it yeah no i mean this is really a sort of fascinating um part of the history of sort of gender variance um, in the medieval world at large and in the pre-modern world. Um, for me, yeah, for me, the term trans monks is really about helping us to think more broadly, not only of what sort of trans studies can help, uh, help us understand about the past, um, but also to acknowledge the diversity of gender identity in the past that is not just reductive to how a lot of the literature has treated these figures as women in disguise, per se. And so, for example, um, you have, yeah, you have series stories. They all, uh, they all have similar frameworks, but differ very strongly in how they are articulated at times. Um, one story that I like to use is the figure of Marinos, who's a common mm. um, discussion, uh, a common figure in these discussions. Um, and Marinos um, basically was a figure assigned female at birth. Um, um, Marinus's mother dies, and Marinus basically asks the father, who's going to join a monastery, cut my hair, give me a male name, dress me in male clothing, and I will join you in the monastery. And then from there, um, you know, Marinos joins the monastery, um, passes as a eunuch. That's very important that because mm. Marinos is beardless, there's his understanding Marinos is a eunuch, which speaks a lot to the sort of the openings in sort of gender variants that eunuchs precisely did in the empire they, yes that's right they opened up they, they opened up these spaces which would yeah. otherwise not have existed right um this is su such an important part of this and what's wonderful about these lives is that then so marinos of course there's a challenge to the gender identity this is something very critical oftentimes through an accusation of some form of impropriety sexually. And so Marinos gets accused of impreg impregnating the local innkeeper's daughter. Um, quite fascinatingly, she says it was Marinos, the attractive monk, because these younger monks were understood to be attractive, um, which elements that we can get to um, later on. And Marino says, yes, I have sinned as a man. And basically takes on the child after the child is born, um, raises him as his own child. Um, the text says that he raises him as a father by seeking milk from shepherds um, to nourish him. And eventually there's this sort of revelation when Marinos dies about uh, Marinos's body and this discovery that Marinos had been assigned female at birth and this revelation of just how pious the monk was in um, in throughout his life of having you know endured all these sufferings and that's what is also i think and for me i think what's very powerful to trans communities in the present is to see how this gender identity is something that throughout there is a narrative here not only about piety but a narrative about gender identity that throughout all accusations the easy route would have been to be like hey it's impossible that i could have impregnated the innkeeper's daughter there's always this idea that there is sort of a struggle of constant attacks on your gender identity that the monk um, sort of um, supersedes and comes out on the other side of, which I think is why these types of stories are very powerful for trans communities today. And it's even quite interesting that at the end of Marinos's life, the innkeeper's daughter becomes possessed by a demon as sort of mm. a punishment um, for her sins and only is cured from her afflict uh, affliction when she visits the tomb of Marinos and repents. Um, and so in other narratives, you have instances of cross-dressing where a figure lives a period um, of her life as a man and then returns to life um, as a woman. And very interestingly, like the story of Marinos, when it's transmitted in the manuscript tradition, the titles in the key sort of calendars of saints actually says, um, here is the, mo um, the monk Maria whose name was changed to Marinos. So there's this very clear articulation in even the title headers of these texts that there's a, a, an understanding and sort of familiarity and no lack of fear or transphobia is what I'm trying to say about the identity of these figures as understanding that they changed their name and lived as this monk that you know. What's 
Yeah, what's interesting about this is not only the the tests, as you say, you get these, uh, they are, I I guess, identity tests, you like the accusations, but also, and I think this is the case uh, with Marina as well, that that after the death, uh, or indeed sometimes even kind of before the death, the relevant religious authorities didn't recoil in horror. Mm-hmm. And oh my God, we've been duped, and you know mm-hmm. we're not going to bury we're not going to bury them properly, or we're going to put them in a pauper's grave, or kind of whatever. In fact, very often the opposite. They're still elevated as holy figures, and and in some cases, and I think you refer to this uh, as almost in some ways having proven themselves um, through their um, maintenance of their gender identity, however they however that ended up being chosen, despite. This pressure, so you might. I think you you might expect perhaps that once discovered, you know, the 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 equivalent of the abbot would be horrified and say, "I can't believe it," and I, you know, she she tricked me, and they right. they didn't. And in fact, they very often continue to use the preferred pronouns to use modern terminology mm-hmm. as well, and actually ele- elevate them as holy figures and give them proper burial and so on too. That that really struck me. Did that surprise you at all, or is that consistent with with a sort of in some ways a kind of view of these sorts of trans monks than we might otherwise have expected? Yeah, and you know, one of the things. That's interesting also is the stories where the abbot knows before and actually you have these very, what I think is a very sort of touching and difficult thing is these moments of intercession um, from the monk who's like, please do not reveal my gender identity. Like, 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 I mean, brother, please do not uh, um, reveal like my birth assigned sex. Like, please do not prepare my body for burial once I die. And then there's always this moment of of sort of something went awry and by accident the brothers went and prepared the body and then there's this moment of outing or revelation that happens and there is this is very clear piety and what's very interesting and the work that really needs to be done here is to really look at these manuscripts and see questions like what pronouns are being used because you do have some instances where they're using male pronouns throughout and then the last line says and her name was and they give the birth assigned name and you as a historian that's very attuned to these things, I'm like, well, that could be a later interpolation by a later scribe. And so what what does the manuscript tradition show us about how these saints were being understood and in different contexts? And so you do have um, what's interesting here is that the the sort of the either the misogyny of Christianity in this sort of idea of like an ascension of the sexes or the sort of language of ascent through as masculinity being more pious produced a space for maneuvering for these figures um, to exist, which for me really operates in this in-between space of understanding that um, these types of sort of pre-modern trans histories um, may not have full representation as we would understand them, but have these really interesting glimpses and glimmers, especially if you understand trans identity as being not something exclusively modern, but it's sort of a part of the human experience, of course, um, mm. that we can then see these sort of spaces for identification or relationship or modeling that could be seen here. And of course, one of the greatest anxieties here is of the, as I said earlier, the prohibitions against cross-dressing and so forth that makes these makes the sort of transmission and praising of these texts all the more fascinating because you have explicit text telling you, please don't do this. And yet this sort of total, yeah, I think it's very true that the lack of shock um, and the lack of sort of sensationalization is something that I found very striking. Right. Well, I, I think what really, um, you asked me about what surprised me in a sense, and I think what also surprised me was the sensitivity that these texts had toward these figures and the uh, a sort of a, an attunement to their lives that at some times was strikingly modern, not in my sort of trying to like force the situation but just in ways that the text spoke to me very powerfully about um how they were being handled and how their stories were being recounted so it's making me wonder a little bit about the extent to which the ident- gender identity and the changes uh, in gender identity was held in tension with and or in some ways at least in the context of other questions about that person um, I'm, I'm reminded, actually, I think it's um, there's an Orthodox um, theologian and priest, Alexander Schmemann, uh, and I think it was him who uh, told the story about this young man coming to see him, I think was interested in joining the Orthodox Church or, or whatever. Uh, and every time he met him, he said, "I'm, I, you need to know that I'm gay and you need to be okay with that. And then they talk about theology and stuff. And then the second time he said, you need to know that I'm gay and you need to be okay with that. And then 
the third time they kind of met and he turned to the to, to Shmemo and he said by the way you know I keep saying you know you, you know you know I'm gay right and you need to be okay with that and father Shmemo uh if if I'm getting the, the one correctly but the story holds anyway it's only a modern orthodox theologian says yes, yes, yes I heard you I, I just don't know who you are yet mm. uh, and what I kind of like about that story is that he's he's not he's not dismissing you know what he's saying or saying that look that might be something we need to kind of talk talk about at kind of some point but 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 i don't know who you are yet <laughs> and so actually let's figure out who you are and then the fact that you're gay becomes part of that story but not the predominant part of your story and so I, i'm almost wondering if to some extent i'm now trying to put myself in the minds of a seventh century like syriac uh, abbot which is difficult f- for me easier for you <laughs> but, but almost like okay so we've, so it's complex right yes yes she, natal woman but she's been here you know she's now he she's now, and he has he has been a monk in our community and then we discover let's say we didn't know that actually she's natally kind of female well let's look at that in the context of their lives let's look at that in the context of what good what they did in the world etc and not and not allow that to become the only determining factor as it might do in you know different kinds of cultures is, am i being too fair to that culture no i think i think there is definitely an understanding here. I mean, when you put like these stories in the context of broader saints' lives, you see that, of course, various saints struggle with various aspects of what are essentially trials and tribulations that they endure that rhetorically, at least, as for readers, demonstrate their piety and their attachment to God. And I think that's no different in this situation, where you definitely see that the the aspects of a person's life and their lived experience that they had to struggle with become a part of what elevates this piety and how this figure finds a closeness to God and to sanctity. And so that's very much, I think, part and parcel of it. And I think one of the interesting things that we also see, especially in these lives, is just how prevalent sort of anxieties about same gender desires between monks is and how nonchalant so many of these sources are. So there's, in, in, particularly in these trans monks, because there's this constant conceit of like, you know, you as an author, there's a sort of understanding that you know that it's a woman, but you don't know that it's a woman and it's not a woman. There's there's constantly this play there about gender identity um, that, of course, is very much a sort of medieval um, sort of articulation and not how we would, of course, tell these stories. I just want to make that clear. But mm. there's it, it what it does is that it fractures certain assumptions. So there's this figure where that tries to seduce um, one of these trans monks and she's her name is Melania, um, and at one point says, truly her soul was black, as her name implies, since Melania means dark, um, because she's trying to seduce the monk who is assigned female at birth and there was assigned female at birth. And so therefore there's this sort of idea that it's sort of like she's seducing a woman, but she's also seducing a monk. And you don't know really at the end of the day what what the author thinks is worse from the person's actions. And then you also see moments where there's a very clear handling of these trans monks for, you know, looking youthful and sort of a feminine face. And there's this idea of like, keep them away from the other monks because they're going to stir up desires. And there's this understanding that that's what we always do with these, with monks that have a youthful face or that are young. And so there's this constant demonstration of the broader sexual and gender anxiety that exists within these types of monastic spaces that speak to um, the challenges and as a theme of our conversation, the messiness of these forms of piety, which is part and parcel of these broader challenges of these types of dedicated um, spiritual communities and sort of the sort of journeys towards celibacy and some of the goals of asceticism that various of these communities would have faced. And so um, for me, it's very much so I see this as sort of part of this world where in many ways authors are also thinking of what are things that challenge you toward a sort of closeness to God and like how are you seeking to undertake that. While also I think that one of the great things about doing that rhetorically is that these texts – 
of course, are meant to be emulative. You want readers and listeners in particular to identify in some capacities with the challenges of a given person in these texts and understand that, you know, you too can achieve closeness to God. And so that's, I think, what it, what is really interesting as well, thinking about these as sort of a part of a sort of diversity and sort of inclusivity of the type of closeness to God that you can achieve um, through these various tactics. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I love that. So if I can keep you just for a couple couple more minutes, I'm, um, I'm conscious that I'm taking more of your time than I said, but if you're all right for a... Because uh, I, 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 I want to just talk a little bit about the Annunciation, um, especially as we're recording this, we're what, 10 days from Christmas. So it, it sort of feels like a, a good time to talk about that. And I'll summarize what I think to be the kind of main main message, which I uh, think I, I broadly agree with based on my own knowledge, but um, which is that the Annunciation is the wrong name for what happens to mary um and it should be something more like the ascent or something like that and there's a so uh, and it's really around consent and the key the key message here and the key sort of theological development particularly i guess from the fourth fifth century on um or you can kind of correct me is to really stress the fact that um mary conceived only having consented herself and having done so very rationally and after some thinking it through and that 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 consent becomes important for various reasons going forward which maybe you can talk about you spend a lot of time on this i mean i think this is a a very it's a very substantial chapter uh, of your book and obviously it's highly relevant too to even kind of contemporary debates about mm-hmm. the role of consent and by taking it back to the conception of christ himself you actually situate the 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 question of consent right right there at the beginning of Christian history. Yeah, I mean, so for me, what I love about this story is that it also, it so beautifully captures this idea of the history of Christianity where, you know, the Bible doesn't tell us much. And because the Bible doesn't tell you much about what happened in this moment does not mean that Christian theologians thought, well, that's it. That's all there is to know. There was a total desire to know, wait, how did feasibly, how did Mary conceive? Like, how in the world did she actually conceive? And through working that out, these questions of consent begin to become more and more pressing. And even the theories of how she might have conceived, for example, one of the most established um, ideas that emerges in the early Christian period is that Mary conceived through hearing. Because just like hearing sound penetrates us but does not break any sort of veils or actually penetrates, similarly... That is how Mary conceived through the year. And so you have, you know, wonderful depictions of, you know, a spirit of Christ nose diving into Mary's ear um, and other types of images, particularly in the Western medieval world that are quite lovely. But this creates some anxiety because there was no level of consent there. It was sort of this idea that Mary was just told and then it happened. And so the politics that start to be worked out is that there's a lot of anxiety about this, especially anxieties about um, particularly anti-Christian sentiments about, hey, Mary might have been raped. Maybe she Christ was a product of adultery. What was going on? A lot of the charges. Being yeah, more like, more like a kind of like a, a Zeus type. Yes, thing. The exactly. Here is like a Zeus type rape. That, that's the thing Precise. they're very worried about. Right? And so and that's one of the things that's very important to understand, like. Christianity is defining itself against paganism in very smart and complex ways, which is what I utterly love. Um, And so this idea of like the model of Zeus was also just something that you really want to push against. Like, this is not Zeus. This is not what he was doing. And so this develops over time. In early Christian sources, you really see a sort of sloppiness. Like there's not really a concern about when she actually conceived. And then in later centuries, and particularly in the Byzantine world, you see a shift around the period of iconoclasm, um, roughly in the 8th and um, ninth centuries, um, where there's this real desire to emphasize that Mary did consent. And this demonstrated that just like Eve, she actually, you know, because there's also a certain anxiety of like, so some guy showed up in your room and told you you're going to be the mother of God and you were like, sure, impregnate me. Um, so all of this starts to get worked out more so with this idea that, you know, Mary actually took some time and she debated very carefully before she conceived. And that even sort of helps sort out this idea that, you know, she might have been penetrated through the ear, but then she debated that in her mind and in her heart before agreeing to it. And so had she rejected it, none of it would have happened. 
um, that this was very much part of the agency of Mary. And we have these wonderful depictions that heighten this sort of delayed process and the the rejoicing of the angels when she actually agrees um, with these wonderful depictions of angels rushing up to heaven and then suddenly Christ's throne is empty because he's now inside Mary. Um, so these wonderful depictions that really capture this um, tension. And so you're really seeing Mary here in a very careful way being positioned against Zeus, being positioned, this is not the pagan god. Um, but also Mary is not Eve. Eve hastily consented to what the snake was telling her. Um, and then there's later on, you have this wonderful text that even says that, you know, original sin is partly to blame um, because God knocked Adam unconscious and ripped Eve out of him without asking him first. That there's not, and so there's this, this is a very interesting late argument, but it's a really fascinating one to see even this idea where you see that almost Eve is sort of, the blame is taken off of her and there's this emphasis that consent is really important. And I think for me, and this is how I end this chapter, is to also think about Christ's own sort of challenge in consenting to being crucified. That And this is very important because one of the major debates about what Christ, who Christ was and what he was, was does Christ have a human will? And if Christ had not debated, if Christ had not been scared to be crucified, he would not have a human will. He had to be frail in some capacity. And so that fulfillment of the divine and the human would not have been complete. And so you begin to see how important that aspect of consent is. And one of the things that's interesting in thinking about sort of the subtleties about Byzantine spirituality and religiosity is that, you know, we of course, the crucifixion exists. It's important. But the crucifixion is not, it's not the West, late Western medieval idea where you identify with Christ's suffering, you relate to it, and you you sort of suffer, you, you project suffering onto yourself for what Christ did for you. And that's very much a, that sort of empathetic piety is very much still part of our modern Christianity where like you reflect on Christ's suffering. For the Byzantines and Byzantine theology, there really is an understanding that the miracle is the incarnation. That is when humanity is is united with the divine. And everything that happens, after all, is referred to as the economy, the economia, which is basically the divine dispensation is the sort of theological term that we use for it, which goes basically from the incarnation, highlighting the crucifixion and onto the second coming. That all is sort of a completion. So when Christ passes away or is about to pass away on the cross, he said, he says, it has been completed. And the Greek really is sort of this idea of completion. It is done. Um, and so you really have a sort of decentering of the passion in a way that really emphasizing these moments of consent. And in a sense, in a sense there's more emphasis on the fact that the narrative has begun rather than the narrative has been wrapped up. And so that's something that I think is important to stress because it also demonstrates a different sensibility to the entire corpus of Christianity. There is here a very strong focus on the act of the incarnation in a way that, you know, the sort of moments that we highlight in modern Christianity of the nativity, aka Christmas, and Easter are not really sort of the highlight points. They are sort of more commemorative days that demonstrate the promise that was made in that moment of the incarnation. And so, which is right. why I yes. like to, I, 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 as a scholar, like to de focus on consent as a way of decentering also these more modern assumptions. Yes. Well, in some ways, they're more like milestones along the journey mm -hmm. than the journey uh, itself. I'd probably say a bit more about Pentecost than 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 you just did, but that's a whole that's a whole that's a whole different argument. But the the key, I think, the key point that really emerges, and you use Mary's assent, let's let's uh, and consent uh, and Christ as well, really as an argument for this idea of agency. Uh, I think that's the point, isn't it? It's just that, that throughout it, and you can see that even at the first. If you think about it, the first book of Christian history is called Acts, uh, <laughs> right? So you just kind of carry so so actually it's kind of probably right there in the title, which is Acts, and uh, not not rules, not laws, not responses, not, but Acts, uh, and so it does feel as if like right there from the kind of conception, almost kind of regardless of precise timings and so on, is this sense of of agency. So I want I, I, I would say I, I, obviously I could keep talking to you about 
about this to you forever and i really want to uh, and i think your, your book is really very rich and, and fabulous Thank so you. i expect i expected to enjoy it and enjoyed it even more than than i thought and i really recommend it to people but as you take all of these themes and obviously you've covered a you've covered this huge territory uh in, in this book as you kind of reflect it back and you've done a little bit of this in your previous kind of comments the, the the question really is you you there's a contemporary resonance to this for you Right. You're clearly not just seeing this kind of historical. You're really saying that we can excavate these materials theologically, historically, etc., and really use them to illuminate some of the debates we're having, like right now. I mean, as in kind of you know, the last few years almost uh, around these things. So, what are the what are the kind of for you? How has your view of our current debate around some of these issues around gender identity and so on been informed by, or even changed by, your engagement with this this history and theology of the Byzantine period? Yeah, so definitely I write this book very clearly from my subjectivity as a queer Latinx person that also, you know, understands the challenges that are faced by many of the communities that I'm a part of. Um, and I, for me, I think this this book very much emerged in the margins, which is to say it emerged like Athena fully formed in my head because it was a sort of collection of these really interesting stories that I had been reading um, through my other research and sort of very much struck by the fact that they had never been singled out. And so it covers a lot of ground precisely because I wanted to sort of produce avenues, for, especially for my field, avenues of further research and do a lot of trailblazing in the sense of like a, a time scorched earth, but a scorched earth that really says I'm daring to do what no one has dared to do before so that others can walk this path. And for me, it's also, for a more public audience, it's also to share precisely what I love about the period I study and about the Byzantine Empire. I think it's very easy um, to sort of, you know, be asked, why in the world do you study the Byzantine Empire? Um, it's something that always happens, especially as a queer Latinx person. I'm, I think it's very much like, wait, why? Why would you do this? <laughs> also, a fun question in Greece when, you know, my partner's heading to Athens and I'm heading to Mount Athos, and it's they're very confused at the hotel. Um, and <laughs> for me, I, I really wanted to share a little bit of why I love Byzantium and why I think Byzantium is a lot more interesting than we would assume it to be. Um, and I think by helping us understand these stories um, and putting them boldly out into the world, as I try to do in this book with my terminology and with making sure that the book is not trying to convince anyone, but rather that it is as affirming for the communities that would find investment in these topics. My real my real goal is to understand that, hey, there's a, there's a really interesting world of the Middle Ages out there that exists and has a complex history that really, yeah, it makes everything messy and upsets all your preconceptions about the period and what early Christianity is. And I really would hope that our understanding is also about the evolution that these ideas take and the ability to question, interrogate, and add to debates, not just approach things through a sort of condition of dogma. Like to understand early Christian writers privileging the life of a mother over an unborn child is a very important thing to understand, showing the clemency and compassion um, showing the transmission of knowledge about abortions and contraceptives that are made for an elite group, aka a group that had the privacy and knowledge to undertake these acts safely, really shatters a lot of what we would assume to be happening in this period. And for me, I think that's what's quite powerful and why I really, through op-eds and other venues, really try to like communicate a lot of this information for a, a broader audience, because I think we have a lot to gain from understanding the past. And one of the things that I took away from this book was not that I was trying to make the, the Middle Ages modern, but I was struck about how medieval our modern world is. And not in a pejorative sense of the Middle Ages, but in a sense that understands of how burdened and also opened up we are by this heritage that we have um, in the Western world of the medieval world, that a lot of the debates, both the sort of the um, sort of conservatisms and um, sort of anti-X that we might have, 
is also matched by an openness to gender diversity um, and to other forms of practices that we would assume do not have existed. And so that's, I think, what I think most readers can take away from the book and what I definitely I took away from doing this research. I say that this book made me a better Byzantinist because it showed me just how many sources we have out there and what wealth of information there is to really do exciting work and understand this period better. Well, one of the things that uh, I really appreciated about the book and, and this conversation and what I can see of other work too is your respect for the different points of view, your refusal to simplify, uh, I think, these complex things and your embrace of ambiguity. And so the, the example you just gave around you know, the evidence for the kind of use of abortions and so on, in some cases, when it maybe threatened the case of the mother or in, for some people and some of the hypocrisy around it. So you don't in any way attempt to deny that, you know, that there are also these Christian teachings about the, the, how abortion is immoral um, uh, and sinful, whatever language you choose to use it, but that also there's a kind of recognition about the ambiguity of certain circumstances. So I, I think that's what really strikes me is your, as much your tone uh, and the respect with which you engage with these different points of view because of this inherent ambiguity and messiness and it's in the tension isn't i mean life is in the tensions right it's not in the easy answers it's not in the easy answer of saying oh actually early christians were all in favor of abortion so you know we should obviously keep roe it's no it's like or, or vice versa right it's like uh no in fact when you really read through the text you begin to actually perceive first of all how the texts are sort of reduced to a one-liner of like abortion equals bad um but you begin to see these anxieties of like oh a mother might kill herself undertaking an abortion through certain means, then they will be condemned to hell. But then, wait a second, what about the person who impregnated this figure? Like, what is going to happen to them and what is their responsibility? You begin to see a parsing out of so many complexities around these issues um, that actually demonstrate really what the reality of some of these prohibitions or concerns actually were about, which sometimes were more about the well-being of a person and anxieties about the harm of a procedure or of certain actions, rather than a sort of, um, this is inherently bad in the abstract, and this is why, even though, of course, you know, you can reduce it to that and it can get passed on that way over yeah. millennia. <laughs> on 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 yes and and of course on both sides well that's yeah. actually that's a perfect place to actually to finally let you go because i think this the byzantine has become a sort of term of abuse for something that's unnecessarily complex because largely for bureaucratic reasons but i think actually what you're doing is you're you and you do this in the title of your book and you explain it, actually rehabilitating the idea of byzantine as complexity mm -hmm. and ambiguity and tension uh and, and i think that's the spirit with which you've engaged in the work and this conversation so thanks for the work and really you know, huge thanks for joining me today roland thank you it's been a pleasure thanks for listening to dialogues i hope you enjoyed that conversation and if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate and share the podcast in all the usual places and send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.